All right, so now we're in the presentation layout. And it's my pleasure to introduce a friend and a colleague, Paul Catanzaro. Paul is a forest resources specialist uh, with the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And he's done a lot of work and a lot of thinking um, uh, on the issue of, of how to talk about the future of your land. And I've, uh, I was excited and delighted to get Paul to agree to speak. And, and there's been a lot of interest in this from a lot of people around the country. So uh, with this, I'm going to uh, stop talking. I'm going to turn the stage over to Paul. I'm going to mute my microphone, and I'll just hover here in the background. So Paul, welcome, and the, the show is yours. Thanks, Pete. Good afternoon, all. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to spend an hour with me learning about estate planning. Uh, some people uh, in the natural resources field have been calling this intergenerational transfer or successional planning, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, what the nuances of all of that are. I, I only know that uh, the people I work with are most familiar with the term estate planning, so, so that's what we'll, we'll be using today. My background is actually in silviculture, uh, and, and after leaving graduate school, you know, I, I was sure that I was going to spend my career helping landowners manage their woods. And, uh, but uh, a funny thing happened <laughs> over the first couple years of my career. Uh, I, I realized that the decisions people were making about the future of their land really dwarfed uh, the impacts uh, of the decision they were making about managing their woods. And I realized that the type of civil culture they chose didn't matter if the land was soon divided up so small that it couldn't be managed anymore anyway or uh, especially if it was converted into other uses, such as houses. So although I went to school for silviculture, and uh, I still love silviculture dearly, over the past few years, I've been much more engaged in helping landowners uh, with decisions about the future of their land. Um, I have a couple of uh, logos up on the title screen here, some colleagues that I've worked with, Wendy Sweetser at the Trustees of Reservations and Jay Raskew. Uh, at the North Quabbin, um, and, and we together have been uh, putting together uh, state planning information for landowners that we're going to talk about today. That said, I, I want to say right up front that uh, given my background, uh, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm also not a CPA. I won't be giving any legal advice today or help you understanding the nuances of tax laws. That, that's not what today's presentation is about. I'm sorry if that's disappointing. Today's presentation is to help you as a landowner get a better understanding of the estate planning process for your land and to help you get started. If you're a conservation professional, my hope is to provide you with information that you can share with those landowners that you work with. My experience is that although there are landowners out there ready to dive into the nitty gritty of tax law and ownerships and LLCs and trusts, there's a far greater segment of landowners out there that, that just, just want to start the estate planning process, decide the future of their land. They're just not sure how to get going, and that's what I hope to help you with today. So specifically, we're going to talk about what is estate planning and, and why should you do it. We're going to talk about family communication. I, I know this is a really warm and fuzzy subject, and uh, a lot of people tend to shy away from this, but it, is a, it can be an incredibly important uh, subject in terms of the success of an estate plan, and we're going to be covering um, some family communication and just some general communication subjects today. We're going to talk about uh, some of the major professionals that are involved in estate planning and some of the tools that they use. I find that there's a lot of confusion about uh, which professional people should seek out, what exactly these professionals do, how do they work together, what tools do they use, and what can they offer you as a landowner to meet your, uh, your goals for your land? I'm going to uh, present uh, three or four landowner stories at the end of the presentation. I think they're just great examples of how landowners just like you had these hard conversations and uh, went forward and worked with professionals and developed different strategies um, to achieve their goals. And I think it's a wonderful demonstration of what you, too, can do. And then at the end, we'll, we'll save some time for questions and answers. The chat pod does allow you to type in questions. Uh, I think what I'll do is, to the best of my ability, I'll try to answer those questions as we move through it. Uh, but if that becomes too much and I lose track, I, I might just uh, have to 
uh, just move through the presentation, but I am happy to stay on as long as Pete allows me to and, and pick up any questions at the end. So the goal for today is to get you to the next step. I want you to learn how to improve family communication, to understand the professionals involved in estate planning and what role they play, to see the range of options available, how they can work together to meet a family's goal. Uh, even if you walk away with um, the idea or the knowledge that there are many options out there for you, and these options can be combined and tailored to meet your specific situation, then that's fine. If you don't walk away with what the exact names of all the various things are, that's fine. You know, I, I just want you to walk away knowing that uh, there are professionals out there that can help you and that there are these options and there's, there's, a, there's a way to meet your needs. And this is something I find that, that um, a lot of, stops a lot of landowners from moving forward. You know, I'm hoping that after today you're going to be more confident to take that first step and to start some estate planning. Sometimes it's really a matter of knowing who to call. Sometimes it's a matter of just knowing what questions to ask. And so what I'm hoping is through today's presentation we can help you do that. So the future of land. So why is this important? The average age of a landowner in the Northeast and across the country is over 60 years old. There's a tremendous amount of people that own land that, that uh, are aging. Uh, we know that the baby boomers are beginning to retire. And uh, although many people have said, well, old people have always owned land, uh, that's true. But the percentage and the proportion of those people that own the land now is, is, is really significant. In fact, in Massachusetts, 73% of all of Massachusetts forest parcels, and we define that as over 10 acres, um, are over 55 years old. In New York State, that number is 66 percent. So when we talk about who actually owns our landscape, we all know, I hope we know, um, that uh, it's owned by individuals and families like yourselves. Um, but uh, even more specifically, it's owned by folks that are, are uh, 55 or older. So what's at stake? Well, there's a lot at stake when you take a look at the clean water that flows from your land, the recreational opportunities, the community character, wildlife and biodiversity, forest products, privacy and screening around houses, carbon sequestration, you name it. You know all the, the wonderful uh, laundry list of public benefits that our forests provide. That's what's at stake. Um, and with, with an aging population, all of these independent decisions that all of you are making, that landowners are making across the country, will have a cumulative effect across our landscapes in determining what the future of these benefits are. So frankly, as a natural resource professional, this frightens me a little bit. You know, There's a lot of decisions that will determine uh, the future of our landscapes. And, and that's one of the reasons I've, I've gotten more engaged with, with this subject. However, I'm also human. And um, over the last couple of years working with landowners, I've really seen that um, what's at stake is not just you know cold and slimy stuff like water and, and wood products and so forth that really benefit the, pub the public. What's at stake often are, are families and relationships and um, how families get along and how they will get along in the future. Uh, I've had the um, uh, opportunity to talk to a lot of families that are really struggling with these decisions. I have mothers who, who talk about daughters that won't communicate, and I have sons and daughters that talk about not being able to get their father to make a decision or, or to even bring up the subject of what's going to happen to the land. And the longer those decisions get put off and the more stress on those decisions, you know, the worse the outcome that, that, that can happen. And so uh, not only are these public benefits at stake, but, but so, are, so are families and so are relationships. So let's talk. What is an estate plan? For many people involved in, in forestry, you know, we often think of a forest management plan as, as a single document that maps and defines our property and our goals, objectives, and, and lists recommendations on how to meet those. An estate plan is not a single all-encompassing document. It's, it's, it's a little different than that. I would define an estate plan as a process as opposed to a product. It includes a, the development of a combination of documents, for instance, a will, and tools, for instance, a conservation easement, we'll talk about those later, that achieve your personal and financial goals when implemented together. So it's a several things um, that work together in combination, hopefully complement each other, that will meet your goals and objectives. And that's what we're looking to develop. Uh, estate planning is a huge field. It, it covers everything from 
medical wishes do not resuscitate and, and so on and so on. What we're going to talk about today, of course, is, is, is a conservation-based estate planning. So those issues that deal specifically uh, with land and its conservation. So I just wanted to make sure we had narrowly defined our subject matter. Um, many people, many landowners know their options to subdivide and develop their land. A lot of people know that they can uh, chunk out pieces for their sons and daughters or call someone to build houses or, or call a real estate agent or a developer to to um, build houses and develop land and so forth. Um, however, it's, it's my experience that not many people know about uh, conservation options and uh, legal options to maintain their land uh, through generations. And that's what we're going to talk about specifically today. So what does successful estate planning look like? It'll hopefully meet your goals. Uh, as you get older, you're going to need, you're going to have financial needs, uh, certainly. Uh, after uh, owning your land for a number of years, in some cases decades, you're going to have likely a personal attachment to that land. And so you may have some personal goals for the land as well. Um, and successful estate planning should uh, address both, both of those goals, all of your needs. should also meet the goals of your family. Uh, your family may have different financial needs. Your family may have different personal needs. And reconciling all of those is it can be really tricky business, uh, but hopefully, you know, good successful estate planning will help you do that. Successful estate planning can increase assets to your family. It can avoid taxes. That's always a good thing. And maybe most importantly, it can maintain good family relationships. Um, the longer things go forward without decisions being made. Um, the higher the likelihood that there might be some some uh, repercussions, negative repercussions of that. I, I, I can't believe there's a family out there that hasn't had some sort of disagreement over, I don't know, grandmother's pie plate or a piece of jewelry that was special to everybody or a piece of art or a piece of furniture. Um, and, and it has, uh, on a regular basis, you know, an impacted people's relationships with their family. And when you blow that scale up to something the size of as a piece of land and possibly its value, um, you can imagine um, the impact it can have on family relationships. What's the failure to plan? Well, uh, it's just the opposite. We can have negative financial implications. You can pass on less uh, in terms of money to your, to your uh, family. The land may not be treated as you would like. You may have a real definitive idea of, of how you would like to see your land in the future. And unless you make that decision, formalize those plans, there's no guarantee that that land is going to stay the way you want it. And uh, in fact, it may happen just the opposite. And of course, failure to plan may bring up some, some, some bad feelings among family members. And that's certainly something we want to avoid. So land is an asset. Land is likely, um, for many landowners, one of the most valuable assets that they own. Uh, especially if a family has owned the property for um, for decades. Uh, even though we're in a bit of a real estate slump, uh, land has increased in value dramatically over the last two, three, four, five decades. Uh, and land you know, could be worth, um, especially depending on where you live, something very significant. However, land is not like other assets. It also has significant personal and emotional value. It has attachment to it. It might be the place where your grandparents grew up. It might be the place where you grew up. It might be the place where you visited on summers, or you picked apples, or you splashed in the stream with your mom when you were a kid, or it's where you learned tree ID, or you caught frogs, or you know, maybe any number of things. And, and that's unlike most other assets. People I know don't get that attached to stocks and bonds and get that teary-eyed over it. Um, but land uh, is unique in that way. It has both that financial value, and it has a personal value. And, and for many, that's the challenge. How do you ensure that both financial and personal needs are being met for both yourself and your family? The good news is land is a flexible asset. Land lends itself to creative solutions. And we're going to talk about some of those tools. And we're going to talk, in the, especially in those landowner stories, about what I think were some really neat creative solutions for families to gain uh, both the financial and personal value. It's important uh, to know that there's no one right solution for all landowners. I wish I could just send you all a PDF with the steps 
that would make it right for your particular family. But the reality is every family's financial situation is different. Every, fa uh, every family has their own unique needs. Um, and and there's, so there's no one right solution that's right for everybody. And likewise, unfortunately, there's no one right process for all landowners. Some people uh, might make most sense for them to approach one professional first. It might make sense for another family to, to approach another professional first. And um, so realize that this is a really tailored type of process, and it's tailored to your family's specific needs and dynamics. Family involvement. Uh, when we talk, when I hear people talk about intergenerational turnover and successional planning, um, I cringe a little bit because I, I feel as though the assumption is made that the family is always involved. And I, I'm guessing from many of you, um, that might be the case, uh, that your family will be involved in some way. However, I do know landowners that have said to me, you know what, I'm going to make that decision myself. I raised them, I paid for college, I did everything, I paid the taxes on this land, this is my land, and, and I'm going to make that decision myself. And that's fine. There's, as I said, there's no right answer. Um, and it's up to you as the landowner to decide who's going to make those decisions, how you're going to take input, who you're going to take input from in order for you to, to make those decisions. The other assumption I hear people often make is that, oh, the land will go to the family. That may be the case. And in certain parts of the country, I think that's more the case than in, than in others. However, I, I think it's, it's uh, certainly common uh, for a piece of land to not go to the family or it's common for, for the land to go to one member of the family and another member of the family to be compensated in a different way. So again, family involvement, this is a really dynamic uh, individual process and, um, and it's going to be up to you to decide who's going to make that decision and, and how that's going to unfold. Uh, because communication is such an important uh, subject to cover, I, I'm going to talk about it today. So, uh, and I think even if you're not going to involve your family wholesale, my guess is that there are suggestions and, and considerations within these next set of slides that will be applicable even if you have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your family or even if you're talking to your spouse or what have you. So I, I'm going to cover what it might mean for you to, to get input uh, from your family and how you might best go about that and give you some tips for a family meeting. When might you do that? I can't reiterate this enough. Now is the time. Um, uh, and I think it's a wonderful start that you're on this webinar. It certainly uh, is, a, is a great sign that you're serious about it. You're ready to start tackling some of these questions and ready to get moving on it. Um, but um, waiting until um, someone is sick or someone has passed away is, is certainly not the time to start. That adds a lot of different pressures that this process does not need. If you can, talking to family members in person is best. There's no substitute for getting everyone in the room. It's very helpful to look at facial expressions when you're talking, to look at body language. It's just a part of, of how we as humans um, communicate. And so if you can do it in person, it's ideal to do it in person. So. If you can, and, and many families um, have family members across the country. You, you might live in one state and have one or two children in, in that state and have one or two children out of the state. Um, so if you can get them together, it's best. If you can get them together when it's not a holiday or family celebration, that is ideal. Uh, sometimes, uh, whether it be the holiday season or somebody's birthday, Sometimes that can be a pretty tense situation, at least it is around my house. You know, who's going to sleep where and, and when are people coming in and whose side of the family are we having dinner with as opposed to dessert with and, and there's just there's a lot of complicating factors that go into holidays and family celebrations and sometimes removing those uh, extra pressures can help start the, the conversation off on, on a good foot. Now, we have to be realists. The reality is pulling everybody in from out of state to sit down in your living room and talk about the future of the land just may not be possible with people's lives. So you may have to, when everyone's together for Thanksgiving or, or what have you, get people together and have that conversation. Just be aware that that might come with some added pressures. So who would you have at this meeting? 
in general, it's best to err on the side of, of inclusive at the start of the process. That means inviting all the family members and your spouses. Now, realize, I, <laughs> every family has its own dynamics. That might be something that um, you feel very good about and, and uh, want to do. It might be something, for whatever reason, that you don't feel good about. And again, these are just general guidelines, and you need to tweak it to your own family. In general, having everyone there, including spouses, can, can be beneficial. The reality is your kids are going to share with their spouses what was discussed at the meeting, and their spouses are going to have input to your son or daughter um, at a private time. If everyone's in the room at the same time, there's a guarantee that everyone heard firsthand what was said, and, uh, and everyone has the opportunity to comment back. So it can be a good idea to have everyone in the same room at the same time. I've heard from families that say, gee, I've tried to do this. Some of my kids will, but there's one or two kids, or there's one or two family members, and they just, they just don't want to walk in the room with us. And you can only do your best. Um, it's helpful to try to get everyone in the same room. Um, if you can engage the reluctant family members and include them in a way that makes them feel comfortable, that can be a great strategy to, to engaging them, helping them feel good about being at the meeting. Some examples include if you were going to have the meeting where the property is located and they know the property well, see if he or she will lead a hike around the property. It's a great time for everyone to walk the property, get a sense of what the land means to them, get a sense, you know, oh yeah, this is where we remember we used to build forts here and you know, whatever it is, it gives people a sense of the land and, and, and its surroundings and so forth. And if that is something someone's comfortable with doing, it's a great way to involve them. Maybe the person that's reluctant likes to cook, and so maybe they would help you plan the, the menu for that day. Whatever it is, trying to engage them in a way that makes them feel good and comfortable is a good strategy. Where might you have this? Familiar places equal old habits. We all have these old habits. They, we, we bring them out when we see old friends from high school or college. It's like we, we revert right back to those days. And it's the same thing when we do uh, when we come back to our families. I'm the youngest of three kids, and um, to this day, when I walk into a family uh, gathering, um, you know, my two older brothers are much more dominant than I am. Even though outside of our family, I, I tend to be a big mouth, um, and and that's just that's just the dynamic that my family has. So, and when you get into these familiar places like your home, you can perpetuate those old habits. Somebody picking on somebody, somebody not allowing someone to talk, uh, one of the siblings that always makes the decisions for everyone else. Those old habits can have an impact in, in how your family communicates and the decisions that are made. So you want to be where someone, uh, or excuse me, somewhere where everyone is equally comfortable. That might be at your house. Um, only you know best. It might be at your house, or it might be at a restaurant. It might be at a neutral location. It might be, I don't know, hotel conference room. It could be at a neighbor's house where everyone, uh, you know, a family friend. could be at your uh, local community center. Whatever that is, it, it can make a difference to be in that neutral location so you can lose some of those old habits. How might you prepare? Well, I'm going to put up a number of things that you can do, uh, information that you can collect that might help inform this decision. They might be things such as, who actually owns the land, how much acreage, town zoning, things like that that, that might um, inform the conversation. So if someone says, well, gee, could we build a house out there? You might have that answer then and there. So here are some things that, that you can prepare before the meeting that might help inform people's conversations. Um, as a sidebar, you know, as we talk about working with a professional, having some of this information and this legwork done might make uh, a bill to a, a professional a little cheaper because you've done some legwork and, and they don't have to. It's important to realize that each family has its own dynamics. Um, as we've talked about, that old baggage, sometimes birth order can, can, can dictate that. Uh, an oldest child be more dominant. Sometimes it's past events. Uh, you smashed up my car when you were 16, and I've never forgot, forgiven you for that. I actually had a brother say that to another brother. Um, it's amazing what influences our communication. And what we're trying to do is recognize that those, those dynamics are there and try to get by those, um, because they can affect people's ability to communicate honestly, because they're still trying to get even for a grudge that happened years ago. 
The idea is to, to have an open family communication so you can really get a sense of where people are at. So, and, and I know this is going to sound like the, the top 100 things I learned at, at kindergarten, but sometimes, you know, that's what it takes and it's, it's helpful to remember uh, some important points. Avoid assumptions of any kind. Don't, 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 have, don't assume um, that you know exactly where people are coming from because, because you don't and, and we all have our own uh, pressures and, and so forth and so it's important not to make assumptions. You always ask questions. Well, what did you mean by that? Um, try to get to the root of what they're saying so you understand where they're coming from. This is a really common one. Don't choose a position and defend it. You know, encourage your children to be open. Oftentimes people walk into a situation, into a meeting and say, this is what I think we should do and come hell or high water, you know, I'm going to prove to everybody that this is the best way to do it. Really try to encourage people to keep an open mind. Be respectful of everyone, of course. Giving everyone equal time to speak, and you as a parent, you know, can help facilitate this. You're, there's, there's people that are naturally more quiet and, and more vocal, and uh, making sure you've gone around the room and give everyone a chance is, is, is really helpful. It really includes everybody's voice. And this is an important one. Ask the family to commit to finding a solution that works for everybody. There is a creative solution out there that can address people's financial needs, can address people's personal needs, and it's a matter of working together to, to do that. How do you start the conversation? You know, when you're with people or when you're talking with them individually, if you choose to go that route, um, get a sense from them. You know, what does this land mean to you? Is it your family legacy? Is it, is it something that, that um, we need to pass down from generation to generation, or we need to uh, make sure it never gets developed because it's, this, is what, this is what the legacy of our family? Or is it no more than dollars and cents? It represents X amount of thousands of dollars to your family that you can liquidate and uh, cut up uh, into however many uh, divisions and uh, go ahead and, and, um, and distribute. Or is it something that, that's both? It's, it's a little bit of legacy and it's a little bit of investment. That's a really important thing to, to gain from your children or from whatever heirs you, you might be dealing with. Share with your family what the land means to you. This is a good opportunity for them to hear from you what your, your initial thoughts are, what, what it means to you, why uh, or why not is that land special to you. Uh, if you do nothing else, uh, at least communicating to your children what the land means to you gives them a sense of what you would want done with the land you know, if, if something were to happen and you weren't able to formalize your wishes. Note similarities and difference between yourselves and your, your children or your heirs. And collect questions. You know, people will have questions. Can we actually go out and, and build a house? You know, uh, is our land, does our land have uh, special natural resources on it? Um, you know, what are those things that you need to answer in order to, um, in order to, to make decisions? This is my warning in terms of the um, uh, trained facilitator. Carl, that, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I was on a roll. Um, a trained facilitator can be really helpful, and I know families that have worked with them. Um, a mediator, a facilitator can come into a situation. For those of you not familiar with those terms, they're a professional that um, is, is meant to be an unbiased person that can help facilitate the meeting, can help set the agenda, can help organize people's schedules, set it up, set the location up, and can actually be the one standing at the whiteboard or the piece of paper and and, and going around the room and making sure everyone has a chance to speak and so forth. That can be a very good idea, depending on your family and, and how um, your communication styles, that can, be, that can be a very good idea. Yes, thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, so my warning is, uh, despite good intentions, not all families seem to be able to come to agreement. And it's just the way it is, and, and despite your best efforts, that, that might be the case. But it's important that you as the landowner are able to take the information that you've gotten, uh, that you've collected either from a family meeting or, or individual conversations um, and, and move forward, make a decision. If there's a problem now, the chances are it's going to get worse when you're gone. So if people are in disagreement now, when you pass on, if the question is left unresolved, it's likely that it's going to get more emotional and you won't be there to help mediate and it, it could get, it likely will get worse. And so this, this idea of, ah, I'll just let the kids figure it out, can be a really explosive solution. So, so we've talked about family communication. Um, you've, got, you've gathered input from your kids or, or from your heirs. 
Uh, you've also hopefully have gathered some questions that the kids have, um, possibilities, solutions, um, what, what actually can be done on the land. And so hopefully that will lead you naturally uh, to one of these professionals. And as I said, every process is a little different. So, so the, the uh, questions um, and the information needs you collect will hopefully direct you to, to call one of these estate planning professionals. You can sit down and, and list, I don't know, a dozen or more professionals that deal with estate planning in some way, shape, or form. I've narrowed that down to just a handful of those that I think are, are really important and that are really can be really crucial first calls for a family. We're going to go over those right now and we're going to talk about uh, some of the tools that those estate planning professionals work with that can help you and your family meet those goals. So working with professionals, one of the first things that I've run into with many families is, is a real reluctance and a real hesitancy to actually engage the services of a professional. And, and we all know the reasons why um, it's it can be tough to find one. Um, expense, it can always be a huge issue for families, um, the time it takes, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it, it's important to realize that these professionals can really make a difference um, for you and your family, and, and both financially and passing on more asset, but also uh, in terms of your family relationships and making sure you've formalized your plans. They can provide options that I'm guessing you never even knew existed. They can help you narrow down your options so you can choose the best one based on the input and the feedback that you're giving them. And remember, just because that you've decided not to invest in them in life doesn't mean that they won't be hired in, after you've passed away, um, either through your estate or through your children. Sometimes we can be um, penny wise and pound foolish, um, and, and investing up front can make a huge difference. It's important to work with someone everyone is comfortable with, and, and that might be a lawyer or uh, an accountant or someone that you've used with you've used for years. It can. There have been cases where family members feel that a, uh, if you were to use the accountant of, of one sibling and not the other, is that accountant you know looking out for that one sibling versus the whole family? You can get into a little bit of that. So just make sure everyone feels comfortable uh, with that professional. And like any other professional. You can ask for an estimate of costs. People charge in different ways. They can charge for the job. They can charge for the uh, per hour um, and so forth. So, you know, up front, just like you would with any, um, any professional, it's very reasonable to ask for estimates of costs, how you charge, and so forth. Land is, is, uh, is a unique type of asset. Um, not everyone has a specialty. Some professionals specialize in families. Some professionals, uh, lawyers specialize in medical. You know, everybody has a little bit different uh, specialty, and uh, it's important to work with a professional that understands land, how it's taxed, how it can be passed on, how it can be owned, and it, and um, and if you choose to move down the path of land conservation, um, not all professionals have experience with land conservation. They may not be able to um, give you the options because they simply don't know them. If they know them, they may never have done some of these legal tools, and you might be paying them to, to learn on the job. So it's important um, to work with somebody that has experience in land and conservation, if you choose to go that way, um, because it will help the end product, and it might even help your wallet. So this is the first uh, estate planning professional that, that I want to talk about. Um, it's a professional. They're called a land protection specialist. They work for a land trust, uh, and they also work for government conservation agencies, and they assist landowners who want to achieve their personal financial goals for the land through conservation, meaning all or some of your land you intend to keep undeveloped. Uh, a land trust, for those of you that may not be familiar with the term, a land trust is a nonprofit, non-government organized conservation organization um, as I said, that works with landowners uh, using a variety of tools to help them conserve their land um, so it doesn't get developed. And there's also obviously government agencies that do this. My guess in New York is that DCR has land protection specialists. Um, an example of a land trust might be the Nature Conservancy uh, or the Columbia uh, Conservancy. 
Uh, there's any number of them, and I'm going to show uh, a link to where you can find land trusts as well. But these are land protection specialists. You can give them a call. Unlike other uh, professionals that I'm going to show on the list, they typically don't charge for their services. And they can help you get a sense of your land's natural resource value. They can get you, give you a sense of uh, what your conservation options are. And they can be a really good first call if you want to move in that direction. These are some of the tools they work with. And again, the idea today isn't to, to get into the nitty gritty of this, but I want you to just walk away with the sense that there's a lot of different ways you can move forward and, and uh, achieve your goals. There's something called a, a conservation restriction, we call them in Massachusetts. In most other states, they're called a conservation easement. It's where um, all or part of the land you designate and remove the right to develop on that, but you maintain the right to own it, to farm on it, to engage in active forest management, et cetera. But, um, but it's a tool that can be used to conserve your land. You could also donate or sell your land. You can sell your land at a bargain rate, at something less than market value. Why would you do that? Because there's a greater tax incentive for that. And depending on your individual financial circumstances, maybe it makes more sense for you to do a bargain sale uh, than it does a, a, a fee simple sale. Um, a bequest upon passing away or a reserved life estate. You reserve the right to live on the land as long as you're alive or limited development. Um, most often I hear people talking about this idea of should we conserve the land or should we develop the land? And in reality, for many landowners, it's somewhere in between. They want oftentimes some sort of financial return, but they want oftentimes some sort of uh, land conservation tool. A limited development is something where you can um, go to areas of the land that may not have as much uh, conservation significance, conserve that piece, and maybe uh, designate a couple building lots within there. So these are tools that land protection specialists can help you um, understand and can help you decide if that's right for your land. An estate planning attorney is the next professional. They specialize in legal strategies to help landowners reach your goals. I think everyone probably understands that. And there's a couple things that estate planning attorneys can, can help you with in terms of your land. The first is the distribution uh, of your land and, and of your wealth in general. But uh, let's talk about land. Uh, unless it's specified, uh, it may be assumed um, that the landowner wants to maximize financial gain. In other words, your executor uh, has a fiduciary responsibility uh, to maximize financial gain unless it's designated otherwise. And where would you do that? Well, you could do that in a will. And I think most people have heard what a will is. It's a legal document that communicates how your assets will be distributed. And it's your executor who fulfills that. So this would be a great place to put your, um, your desires for the land and actually um, your instructions and so forth. Increasingly, over the last number of years, uh, trusts have become uh, a, a more popular, uh, I don't know if it's common, uh, tool. And a trust essentially creates a legal entity that's separate from you. It's something different from you. It's a, it's a trust. It's a legal entity uh, to place certain assets. And there are many different kinds of trusts, and there are lawyers who specialize in those. Uh, so I'm not going to get into those. Just know that these are a couple of tools, and the state planning attorney can help you define how you are going to move forward and how you're going to distribute your assets really important to be very specific with your wishes. Ownership is another thing that estate planning attorneys can, can help you with. You can choose, uh, ownership dictates how decisions are made on the land, how land is transferred from one owner to the other, how it is taxed when it's transferred, and that can be a big issue for families, how liability happens on the land if something were to happen, and, and there are different kinds of ownership. There are personal forms of ownership, and everything from you own the land, just you, you're an individual owner, to being joint tenants with somebody, by being, uh, excuse me, uh, tenants by the entirety and tenants in common. And there are differences to each of those as to who owns those, what happens upon the death of one of those owners, where the interest in that land goes, and it has significant implications for, therefore, how decisions are made about the land and how the tax structure uh, is, is, um, is implemented. And so, again, we're not going to give the specifics of this. Know that there are different kinds of ownerships that can help you reach your goals. And an estate planning attorney is someone that can help explain those and choose one. 
This might seem strange for some people uh, to be talking about business ownership. The vast majority of, of people own their land because it's beautiful and they like privacy and, and uh, may or may not be interested in timber harvesting. And, and so to introduce this concept of a business ownership might seem strange. But the reality is it, it, it helps to create a structure for you and your family to, um, to own land together and to reduce taxes on it uh, as it moves through generations to help uh, increase the uh, efficiency of making decisions. For instance, I've got this wonderful little family photo down here. And um, if this is one part of the, the family, and this is another part, and this is another part, how do these three parts of the family work together to create to, to make decisions about, about the land, whether it's just how do we pay taxes and who pays it, or how do we maintain the gate that blocks off the road, or do we do forest management? Um, so how do these individual families make decisions if they own it together? Or in some families, on some pieces of property, every one of those people in the picture might be an owner. And you can imagine what kind of headaches that creates uh, in terms of trying to move forward with decisions and trying to pass land from, from one person to another. Uh, using these business, these forms of business ownership can be a way to help really streamline that process and really meet your needs. A financial planner, and, and this might be someone that you're from very familiar with and maybe use already, but it's a professional who can document you know, where you're at currently with your financial situation and where you need to be heading long term to make sure that you've got enough money for your retirement, uh, to make sure you've got uh, enough money uh, for your children should you choose to pass on money and so forth. How do you actually um, quantify and describe where you're at now and how do you navigate, how do you plot a course to be where you want in the years to come? And a financial planner can be a good first call in terms of just getting a sense of, of where you're at uh, in terms of your land and your financial situation and where you want to be in the future. Tax professionals are an important part of estate planning. There are two in particular. There are, there are attorneys that actually specialize in taxes, and there are certified public accountants who are licensed professionals that, that work with tax code and, and uh, tax return preparation. And, and those with specialties in land and land conservation uh, will have a great understanding of how that might impact uh, your taxes, because there's a number of relevant taxes uh, that come into play if you're a landowner and you're a landowner that's going to sell land or, or pass land on to somebody. Uh, federal and state es uh, ta estate taxes are one, um, and that can be a, a real shifting landscape uh, as to what your individual state might uh, have as their estate tax, and it's certainly a, a shifting uh, landscape as far as what the federal government does with their estate taxes. There are gift taxes, capital gains taxes apply in terms of land. Uh, federal income and property taxes, all of those play a role in how you pass on land and having someone like an estate planning attorney, or excuse me, a tax attorney or a CPA to help you understand your individual situation, how you can minimize, if these taxes are uh, applicable to you, how you can minimize these taxes and actually pass on more wealth uh, to your children in the future. An appraiser is someone you may not have thought of uh, right off front, but appraiser is a licensed professional that can actually come in and determine the current market value of your land. They do this by comparing it to other sales in your area. We all can go to our local town or county assessor and, and take a look at the assessor records and, and what we're being um, assessed for, but the reality is that that really doesn't give a, a, a terribly uh, accurate picture all the time of what the exact appraisal is. And in fact, um, the IRS really only recognizes qualified independent appraisers um, uh, for those that are valuing uh, conservation easements um, and, 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 and land that's, that's being moved into conservation. So uh, this can be a, an important step if you don't really even have a sense of what your land is worth, uh, especially if it's been, you've owned it for decades. This can be a good way of just getting an idea of what you're working with as far as an asset. So here's someone that you're probably familiar with, a forester. Certainly, uh, families are interested sometimes in what their land management options are, and the kids might be interested in that, uh, or who owns your property next. A timber appraisal, uh, something that a forester can do. Uh, they can give you a sense of what that timber is worth. 
that might have ramifications for the tax portion of your estate planning. Current use, excuse me, property taxes can always be uh, an issue in terms of families holding on to land and landowners holding on to land. Each state has a current use program or a special use program that can uh, help landowners minimize those property taxes. Sometimes slash oftentimes that involves uh, or can involve um, active forest management. Uh, many times uh, your, your state service forester or a consulting forester are, are well versed in these programs and so this can be a nice way to uh, learn more about those options. This is a slide I threw in here. Um, you know, I, I work with uh, landowners uh, oftentimes that have been really involved with their properties and they've developed a, a, a real attachment to it and they really feel strongly about its conservation and its management and so forth. That's really that's really powerful knowledge and experience that you as a landowner have that your children probably don't unless they've been really involved with you and helping you manage the property. And most landowners I know, the children have been minimally involved to, to not evolved at all. It can be helpful for your children if you choose to pass on to children um, to let them know what that land means to you, what your goals have been over the years, if you've done any management, where have you done it, why have you done it, which professionals they've used, and maybe more importantly, if you've had if you've had a good experience using them, what management um, options might might be uh, coming down the road? Um, any of that information can be really helpful to a son or a daughter, or, or even the next owner, even though they may not be in your family, in terms of what you were trying to do out there and, and the knowledge and experience that that you've gained over the years. This can be a, a really helpful uh, thing to communicate. So uh, where do I find these professionals? And um, I'm going to be honest with you, I wimped out a little bit. So I've got some, some recommendations for you. Some are more specific than others. Um, most people uh, are, are most comfortable, for very good reason, talking to our friends and families. Our friends and families are those people that understand us. They know our individual family dynamics and, and the, the situation that you're trying to do. Um, they oftentimes uh, are in similar situations themselves, so they're people we trust. Um, they've gone through the process oftentimes and, and we're able to, to gain experience and knowledge from, from what they've done. So um, going to your starting with friends and families about who they have, um, who they've used in the past um, is a great way to get started in terms of finding some of these professionals. If you're interested in finding a, a land protection specialist, there's uh, an organization called the Land Trust Alliance, LTA, and they have a website um, that I've got up here on the screen that allows you to click on your state, click on, I believe, your county, and up will pop a list of land trusts that work in your area that are members of the Land Trust uh, Alliance. And, um, and so that can be a great way to find specific land trusts. Professional associations can be another great idea, um, whether it be CPAs, uh, estate planning attorneys, um, there's even uh, professional associations for facilitators and mediators. That can be a good way to find um, some recommendations. And one bullet that I'm embarrassed that I didn't put up here um, that I should have is, is professionals. Um, they can be the, you know, the forester that, you, that you've worked with for years might have clients that have used and had a really good experience with an estate planning attorney. Or your land trust, your local land trust and your land, tr uh, excuse me, your land protection specialist may have a great idea of a, of, of a real crackerjack tax attorney that other landowners have used. So again, it begin, you know, one step uh, begets the next step. So getting in contact with a professional and finding out from them who, who, who are other professionals that they've worked with and had a good experience can be another great way. So um, in Massachusetts, uh, there are Massachusetts landowners on masswoods.net, which is our website, you can uh, enter your zip code here and up will pop a list, oh my goodness, I can't see that very well, of local land trusts that work in your town, statewide land trusts that obviously work in your town. You can find estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, appraisers, and mediators. Um, so you can find each of those if you go to masswoods.net. Shameless self-promotion. So I want to close today with a, with a couple of family stories that I, I hope illustrate in some ways the unique nature that families uh, have gone through, uh, the pr unique process families have gone through to come up with their solution 
and I also want it to demonstrate the um, unique nature of their answers because they're not all the same. And I, I hope the stories demonstrate that. And there's no better way than to learn from other families that have been in your exact situation. So here's the Smith family. Uh, so these are all um, these are all true stories. They're all based in Massachusetts, but they have broad implications across the country. I hope you'll see. Um, names have been changed to protect the innocent, as they say, but but these are real stories with real uh, real people. Mrs. Smith owns a farmhouse, uh, 280 acres. She, uh, the family's been in this. Uh, excuse me. The land's been in the Smith family for 200 years, and she was very interested in planning its future. Uh, so her daughters can continue to use it. 200 years worth of Smiths have been there and she wanted to, to keep it going. So she started a conversation with both of her daughters to find out what their needs were. One daughter was ready to move back to the homestead. She was very interested in starting a bed and breakfast and uh, was ready for a lifestyle change and she really wanted to come back and live at that house. The other daughter lived in Maine and wanted nothing to do with that land, wanted nothing to do with the house. Um, and so here you are as, as a mom uh, or a landowner, as a parent, and you know, trying to make that decision, what's equal, what's fair, what meets my goals in terms of the way I want to see the land. Um, and this is how the Smith family decided to do it. Mrs. Smith started by having the house and the land appraised. Because of the appraisal, uh, they knew that the value triggered, at least at that time that year, the federal estate taxes, and they knew that the family wouldn't have enough money to pay for it. So they were likely going to have to sell off some land if they, if they indeed had to pay those estate taxes. Um, they worked with an attorney, an accountant, a CPA, and a local land trust to develop a way to keep their land natural while providing the values both daughters wanted. And this is, this is what they decided to do. Um, the the pink square is the original family homestead. So that's where the family's house is, and that's what the daughter that wanted to move back to the property got. She got the house, and she got this two-acre parcel. This large green part of the property is land that was um, which a conservation easement was placed on. So the land is is permanently protected. It enhances the value of the house in the experience of people that want to come to the bed and breakfast, but it cannot be developed, but it meets the mother's wish of seeing the Smith family legacy maintained in perpetuity by keeping it in its natural state. And then the uh, daughter from Maine um, was able to get, or she was given, the four building lots. And the value of these four building lots equaled, uh, more or less, the value of the house and the acreage without the, the right to build on it. So this is how they went forward in finding out information uh, about, about the decisions they needed to make about their land, worked with professionals on some options, and came up with a solution that met both of their children's needs and their mom's. This is a story about the Rileys, and it il illustrates, I think, in a good way, family communication. Uh, Grandma Riley owned 200 acres uh, in, the in the town of Barrie, uh, she really, uh, by all accounts, she was a real character. Uh, she used to run the kids around in a, in a 19, old 1940s World War II Willys Jeep, and they used to run around the property. That's how the kids learned to drive at age 12. Um, and she really spent a lot of time with the kids, really loved the land, taught them about animals and the pond and so forth. She became very ill, and she had nothing in her will about that, what to do with the land. And it was a big piece of land, and it was expensive, and the grandkids were very concerned about the taxes. Um, one of the granddaughters was given power of attorney, not the other two. That can always be a dangerous situation. But they worked together to conserve the land to honor the grand's wishes. They knew that the Grandma Riley would, would want that land conserved, and so they, they did their best to do the right thing. This is what they did. So the entire property, the lime green, the brown, and the yellow, was the original property. This is where the original homestead was that Grandma Riley lived in. This is state conservation land owned by a state agency. What they ultimately did was they sold some, um, they sold some land to the state. Okay, They donated the conserv conservation easement on the rest of the land. Why did they donate it? Because through uh, they would have been charged capital gains here for income 
and the donation helps offset that. And then what they did was one granddaughter was given the house and land, one granddaughter was given two acres to build a house, and the grandson was given six acres to build his house on. At the end of the day, the property was conserved, it, they fulfilled their grand's wishes, they were able to keep the property, and now their entire family lives on it. This is a little bit, this is a, <laughs> this is a bit of a dangerous case study to put up because she really had nothing in writing. She really had nothing formal to say that that's what she wanted to have happen. But it's such a great story about family communication and, and how well she instilled that land ethic in her grandkids that they were able to communicate, work together, and, and do good things. This morning on my way to work, I added this other case study because I, I, I just wanted to show you what can happen when you do nothing. Again, true story. Um, uh, 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 Alma Jones lived on the property for two, her family for 200 years, exact same. Um, her siblings moved away. She remained on the farm. She never married. The local historical society, uh, she did want to keep her land the way it is in its natural state. In fact, she talked to the local historical society about turning their house into a museum. Oh, I don't know why that happened. She spoke with a land trust and her lawyer about her options. She did all the right things. She's communicating. But at the end of the day, she never reached a final decision and never formalized it. And this is what happened. She ended up passing on her land to three nieces. One niece really knew what she wanted and contacted the land trust to, to fulfill her aunt's wishes. The other two nieces were given thirds, and they sold their two-thirds, each of their thirds, to a land developer. The first niece gave her interest and some money to a land trust, and that's where it stands today. The land trust um, has one third, the developer has two thirds, and uh, either one can petition for ownership, neither has. Um, the house has fallen down in disrepair, and, um, and, and it's caused a lot of conflict within the family between the cousins, between the nieces. And, and it's a great example of, you know, boy, she, she did everything right except bring the ball across the finish line. I mean, she really didn't, uh, she didn't formalize that. My last case study of the Thompsons, the Thompson family uh, owns a smaller acreage, 45, owned it for a while, and they're at a point in their family's history where it was going to go from three members to 12, and they really knew that that was going to cause some issues. So they set up a family trust. They created a legal trust with a lawyer, and each branch of the family was given one-third interest. Uh, and, and appointed, and appointed a, a representative trustee to, to sit in for them on that, on that board. They set it up so individuals can opt out but not be bought out because they wanted to make sure through the generations it would be affordable for anybody that wanted to be a part of it. And they were, they've been able to keep the land. Recently, uh, we had an ice storm a couple of years ago. They've gotten involved with forest management. They hired a consulting forester because they've been having uh, issues with how to maintain the land and where do they come up with money to do that. They hired a consulting forester in response to the ice storm. They joined the current use program to reduce taxes for the family. They implemented a small timber harvest. And the proceeds from the timber sale go right back into maintaining and improving the land, and the trust runs that. So this is a way a family has found a way through a legal mechanism to maintain their land and through active management and current use they actually are able to keep it going and maintain it with no out-of-pocket expenses. And based on the last timber harvest, they built this porch on the family house that's on the property, and it's their family tradition that every 4th of July they get together, and they never had a place that was big enough for everyone to sit down. And it was really important for them to, to have a place for everyone to sit together at one table on the 4th of July. So they took the proceeds and they built this wonderful porch, and this is how their family um, uh, gets together, uses the land. So a couple of uh, summary slides. Um, remember that land is not like other assets because it has both financial and personal value. It is a flexible asset, and I hope you've seen from these case studies, these family stories, that people can do a variety of different things, that you can do a variety of things to meet your needs. Oftentimes, my experience is people know their development options, but not their conservation options. And it's important to communicate and formalize your wishes if you want to make sure that uh, you, know, you have a say in what happens in your land. And there's no doubt the time is to start now. This is a great start, I hope, for you uh, to get going on, on your estate planning. 
Um, it's not. E I would love to be able to say I could wave a magic wand and make it easy. It, it's not. It's homework and it's time. Um, but you know, in terms of passing on asset to your family and ensuring their good relationships, it's critically important. So, uh, last slide. Next steps. You know, just a real cliff notes. Have a constructive family conversation. You can do that as a family meeting. You can do that as individual conversations. You know best on who to include and how to do that. Develop a list of questions and informational needs that you need to move forward. Talk to a professional that makes sense based on those questions. Learn your options. Formalize your wishes. And keep moving forward. There is an answer that's right for your family. It's that classic cliche of the first step is oftentimes the hardest. And uh, it's a matter of just kind of jumping into the pool at some point and, um, and then letting the steps um, logically unfold for you there. The other thing I'll say is um, you are going to have really unique and critical information um, that you will have accumulated by going through this process. There are literally hundreds of thousands of families across the Northeast and the country struggling with these same questions. If you run into somebody, you are now a fantastic resource to help them find a professional, to share your story on what you did right, maybe to share your story on what you did wrong so they don't repeat it. But you know you are a really important resource as you move forward. So that's what I have. Um, I've run over a little bit. I apologize. I'd be happy to stay and answer any questions you have. My colleagues and I uh, recently put out a publication called Your Land, Your Legacy uh, that Pete uh, has posted. And there's the web address. And um, if you would like it, I'd be happy. They're free. I'd be happy to send you copies for your organization or for your, uh, yourself or your neighbors. But with that, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, wish you well. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, and I'll be reviewing this and thinking about uh, getting my getting our daughters more involved in the woodlot. Um, so I've, I've changed the layout a little bit. You can still see Paul's contact information. Um, the other things the, that I've done, I've, I've expanded the chat frame so that people can ask questions. So please feel free to uh, submit your questions to Paul. He's available for a few minutes here to respond. And at the top of the screen, there is a um, another chat pod that's called Exit Survey. And uh, what I'd like you to do, please, is click on that link. That's the Exit Survey so that we can gather your thoughts and comments and reactions to Paul's webinar. I use that to, one to document the impact of the webinars, but also to give feedback to my speakers so that they can think about the types of, of programming that they deliver. So um, with that, I'll, I'll let, uh, let you all, if you have uh, questions or comments, please feel free to, um, to share those now with Paul. Uh, Pete? Paul, maybe you'd like to comment on Terry has a, a comment about um, to, uh, including um, logging options and managements within a conservation easement. How, how does how does someone go about making sure that that their support for active yeah, that, management that's a great is retained question. within um, a conservation uh, easement? Pete, before I answer that, I just want to let you know that I'm seeing a poll up on my screen that's covering the questions. Um, so I don't know if that's something, I don't know if that's something you can move. But um, I, I will, uh, Terry, that's a great question. Um, a lot of landowners, uh, especially those that have been involved in active forest management, are interested in maintaining that uh, on their land. Um, I have a couple thoughts for you. The first is, when you work with a conservation organization, it's important to work with one that has complementary and similar goals that you have. Some conservation organizations will be very open to and may even encourage active management, agriculture, and forestry on the land. Some, uh, based on their goals, their organization's goals, may not be interested in that. So the first thing would be to make sure you hook up with a conservation organization that shares your goals. And, uh, and if you're talking to one that doesn't, 
ask them to recommend, and, and conservation organizations do this as a matter of course, to recommend someone locally that you can talk to that would, would be helpful. The second thing is to realize that um, forest management can be put as a, as a right uh, in your conservation easement. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that future landowners have to manage. It's not like a current use program where everyone has to manage. It, it only gives them the, the right to manage in the future. Um, and you can include, uh, which is a very good thing, I guess, in, in my mind, um, you can include within there uh, some language as to what the sideboards are. In other words, um, do they have to work with a professional forester? Do they have to manage under a forest stewardship uh, certified management plan? Um, you know, are there limitations to where on the property they can manage, etc.? So that, that's a language you can work out with your individual conservation organization. Oftentimes, they have some uh, standard language that they'll, they'll, work, they'll put in there or that start, that, excuse me, at least is the beginning uh, starting point for the conversation with them about how to move forward with that. Great question. Uh, Pete, I guess you'll have to just tell me the question because I can't. Okay, so you can't. Uh, your, I don't see what uh, it's your. Uh, I don't see what you're not that you seeing. put up as sure. an, uh, the old poll that we minimized. Okay. Really, I don't see that at all. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not there. Let's see. Is here. there another question you can feed me? This is strange. Ta-da! Um, That's it. Thanks, brother. Does that help? So what, um, th there's a comment about, um, I've lost where it was, but it was, it was about the, the trained volunteers. Many of these, many of the states that are represented in today's audience have trained volunteers. Uh, they're called uh, keystone cooperators or uh, coverts cooperators or master forest owners or um, forest stewards or you know there's there's a, they go by different names in different states what role might these trained volunteers play in helping uh, landowners get started with the process of of talking through um, that's great yeah and I alluded to it in one of my uh, last slides in regard to being able to help other families in this situation there's no doubt, uh, the research is very clear that when landowners need to make a decision about their land, they go right to a friend or a neighbor or a family member. Um, in fact, friends and neighbors are the most, uh, arguably the most influential source of information um, for landowners and their decisions about land. So you can play a huge role in helping landowners uh, make good decisions. Now, how can you play that huge role? You can be a, a conduit. You can be that connection between a landowner who's struggling with a decision and connect them to the local land trust or a good estate planning attorney that you know of. So you can help them find, um, find that uh, estate uh, planning professional to help them sort out their options. You can let them know what some of their uh, conservation options are. You can talk to them about what a, what a, a conservation easement is. Um, and you don't have to. You don't have to be an expert to, to be really helpful. Um, you don't even have to go into depth about these tools. Don't let you know a lack of, of specific information about trusts and things stop you from being a good neighbor. You can give them a good publication. Um, you can send them to a, a website. You can help introduce them to a local land protection specialist. Those are all really powerful things. The reality is, if you're as a as a as a community leader in your town, you know oftentimes who are making these decisions, who's struggling, who's who's just had a death in the family, who's you know who's trying to make these decisions. You know who's making those decisions. You can and and as a trusted member of the community, you can approach them with information that can make a huge difference in their lives. Um, another way you can help. I had a, a, key, a Keystone cooperator uh, in in our state. Uh, emailed me this week. He was unfortunately unable to be on this um, this webinar. But what he's going to do is he's invited four or five landowners to his house, and they're going to uh, after Pete puts up the recording of this presentation, they're going to watch the presentation together and then sit around and talk. And and you know oftentimes um, I, I think the most powerful conservation tool we have is 
a good pot of coffee and, and, and a good pie. Uh, get people together in a room, uh, give them some information, introduce them to a professional, and, and, and you can really help them a lot. That's a, that's a great idea and a, and a great use of the recording is to to, to sit around and, and uh, use it to, to launch and, and encourage and facilitate a conversation. So that's neat. How about are there any special concerns in terms of um, your local town assessor that, you know, are, is there, are there, are there uh, things to do or not to do to, to, uh, um, to improve your uh, whatever options when, when you think about kind of the, the land taxes you know I know in New York and I'm sure in other states land taxes are outrageous so are there are there ways to address that from a from a town assessor's perspective uh, were you asking me Pete oh I'm sorry all right uh, you mean so how yeah, do assessors uh, <laughs> play into this yeah uh, so Right. So, how do you how do assessors tie into it? You know, in several of the graphics, you showed that there were parcels that were broken out. I'm assuming that those are going to have different tax um, yeah, they, issues associated with them when they're broken out. You know, as small parcels in a residential lot versus a, um, you know, versus a yeah, rural it can be it can be a, 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 a hand holding like process uh, for some people. Uh, I'm sure there are some assessors out there uh, that are really on top of it in terms of some of these tools and, and the impacts they have on, uh, or the impacts they should have on your assessment. But that's not to say that all of them or even a majority of them um, understand what a conservation easement is and, and how all of this plays out. Um, it can be helpful to um, obviously make sure after you've done uh, some of these, use some of these tools um, that you check the assessment. Uh, that you check how you're being taxed, how it's being valued, and so forth. And if you have any questions, that you take that opportunity to to work with your local assessor to help them understand, for instance, and this is one of the biggest ones I run into, um, that if it's a land with a conservation easement on it, that it can't be developed, and therefore it shouldn't be a pre uh, assessed at uh, a full development you know, uh, valuation, that uh, it actually cannot be, and therefore you shouldn't be charged. And there's, at least in Massachusetts, growing precedent um, over the last several years that, that that's becoming the norm, that if assessors are doing that, that um, there's growing uh, legal precedent to, 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 you know, for them to fall back on and say, oh, I see, I, I, need to, I need to assess this at a lower value. But it's something you've got to keep your eye on, there's no doubt. And there's people working locally, a, a local land trust, I'm sure, if there's an issue, um, can help you answer some of these questions. Uh, with more local information. They may know the exact precedent. They may have had dealings with that same assessor and can be a real uh, real uh, resource for you. Great. Well, if there are uh, no other questions, there's everybody enjoyed it very much. Um, and it looks like some folks have had to get on with their day. What I'll do is I will uh, capture these comments. I know that early on there were several links that were posted to different land trust associations and uh, land trust networks. I will capture those, distill them down, and uh, include those on the uh, forestconnect.info slash forum website when I post the recording so people can have a, a convenient place to go and, and capture those individual links. Uh, before we sign off, I see that, a, uh, that Herb has a question about um, conservation easements relative to uh, natural gas exploration. Right. Yeah, I can. Susan Thanks. Has so, Herb, I don't have a uh, particular ex experience with hydrofacking, although my understanding is, you know, um, your land is, uh, one of the common analogies, your land is like a bundle of sticks, and you can give those sticks away or sell those sticks individually, and each of those sticks is one of the rights. So, it's the right to develop, the right to manage your land, to engage in agriculture, to do uh, a quarry or do some gravel operation, you know, every, your land has a lot of different rights. It has water rights. It has rights above ground, below ground. So um, I'm pretty sure that you could structure a conservation easement that would either allow or not allow hydrofracking. It's a matter of how you as a landowner um, want to address that. 
but it's also a matter of how the conservation organization feels about that. You need, you need a good match. In other words, if you want to um, allow it, you need to make sure that you're working with a conservation organization that shares that same perspective on hydrofracking, and, and, and if that makes sense. But yes, I mean, in a conservation easement, um, you work with a conservation organization, that's, you can structure it. It's a very um, uh, flexible tool, which is why it's becoming more and more popular, because landowners can really kind of fine tune what their vision is for their land and, um, and ensure that through an easement. Uh, and Susan had a question. I rent land to a local farmer. If I do a CR, can I still? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, right. If I do a conservation, conservation restriction, also restriction. known as a conservation easement in other states, that land is your land. You know, you still own it. You're still on the hook for taxes, although they should be lower. Um, but yeah, you can engage in agriculture and forestry and, and take payments and so forth. No one has an interest in your land. Um, it's, it's your land. It's just that you've either sold or uh, donated, depending on a couple of factors, uh, the easement and therefore no longer have that right. That right has been extinguished is what they say. So the right to develop has been extinguished. Everything else is the same. Uh, so with that, I don't know if there are any other questions. I would be happy to answer uh, questions offline. My contact information is there and email address. Feel free to contact me anytime. And uh, Pete, thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, Paul, thank you. This was a great presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for their uh, participation as well. Um, and if uh, anybody's interested, we'll be back again tonight at 7 p.m. So, Paul, uh, we should probably do a sound check with you uh, between 6.30 and 6.45 just to make sure everything's still set up. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul, and everybody enjoy a... Take care. Bit of warmth here this afternoon. Have a great day.